Hello, everyone, and welcome to Mayor Brown's The Current Tax Landscape and What's on the Horizon in Asia, the European Union, and Brazil webinar. Today's segment is part one of a two-part series on taxation of inbound fund investment exits. My name is Andy Beck, and I'm a partner in Mayor Brown's San Francisco office and a member of the Tax Transactions Practice Group. Joining me today as co-presenters from our tax practice, are Benjamin Homo, a partner in our Paris, France office, and Celso Grisi, a partner in the Sao Paulo, Brazil office. Before we begin, we'd like to mention a few housekeeping announcements. Please note, when accessing Mayor Brown webinars via our ON24 platform, we suggest avoiding use of desktop virtualization software, such as Citrix, to decrease disruption on quality loss. Secondly, as listed under the FAQ widget on the right side of your screen, today's program is being streamed through your computer. There is no dial-in number. For the best audio quality, please make sure your computer speakers or headset are turned on and the volume is up so you can hear the presentation. If you have any questions that are unanswered during the presentation, I invite you to submit them using the Q&A feature on the right side of your screen, and we'll do our best to follow up with you directly after the webinar has ended. Regarding CLE credit, we'll be providing an alpha numeric code during the presentation. In order to receive CLE credit, participants must record this code on the virtual sign-in sheet that was emailed to you with the login instructions for today's program. These forms are also available to download on the right-hand side of your screen on the resource list if you need them. In addition, please visit our COVID-19 web portal on mayorbrown.com, which is a one-stop resource center that aggregates the latest Mayor Brown legal updates and insights on COVID-19 and includes links to other useful resources. With that said, let's go to work. Today, when, for example, a U.S. private equity fund exits from its overseas investment by disposing of its share interest in the target, the exit-related tax at stake can be a significant amount. Twenty years ago, I remember assisting funds on tax assessments that were, say, in the $10 million range. Now it is not unusual to see $100 million-plus tax assessments imposed by the local tax authorities. Most of this is practical reality. Deal sizes are often much bigger than 20 years ago due to various reasons, including the globalization trends and the success of targeted fund capital raises. But the flip side of this is the fact that the tax authorities have become much more sophisticated when it comes to cross-border tax issues and are increasingly scrutinizing the cross-border elements of an inbound structure. A good example of this would be the focus on tax treaty application from a treaty-based claim of an interest and dividend withholding tax exemption to a capital gains tax exemption at exit. In addition, many countries are resorting to new tools, such as substance over form, sham transactions, staff transaction doctrine, and the catch-all GAR, or general anti-avoidance rule, to undo the form and the underlying tax benefits of the transaction. Let me talk about the next two points on the slide together. It is no secret that in many parts of the world, arguably more so in emerging market countries, private equity investment attracts heightened attention. Some of the underlying reasons could be the eye-catching deal size, an acquisition of a former public sector asset, or the fact that the local asset acquired its flip with a significant return on investment. I remember well the Asian financial crisis in late 90s, most likely due to the many late night hours working on deals involving acquisitions of distressed assets in affected Asian countries. When in early 2000s, those assets recovered and were flipped as substantial gains with often zero local tax on the gain, there was public outcry fueled by media coverage, especially in countries like Korea, that directly led to aggressive tax audits on the zero tax at exit claims by the private equity funds. Public awareness of perceived tax avoidance by companies has grown significantly in recent years, due in part to mainstream media's increasing coverage of the topic in recent years. 
This trend will only increase and many countries are highly, highly likely to scrutinize a private equity fund's exit in a tax advantage tax advantaged manner in the current environment and in the post-pandemic years to come. A related note on the expected negative publicity. A pre-exit advanced strategy to anticipate the publicity and to formulate ways to address them should be a part of the overall controversy defense tactics. One of the key factors behind the accelerated sophistication of the local tax authorities in recent years has been the OECD's ongoing work on BAPS, base erosion and profit shifting. Countries globally participated in this effort and the actual implementation of the minimum standards is being carried out on an expedited basis through unprecedented mechanisms such as a multilateral instrument. For example, the multilateral convention to implement tax treaty related measures to prevent base erosion and profit shifting. These globally coordinated tax initiatives have led to many countries, including Asian and Latin American countries, actively participating in discussing ways to address perceived tax treaty abuses, which has in turn contributed to a better awareness and understanding of, the, of often complex tax issues embedded in cross-border transactions. In fact, we're seeing BAS-related literature and reports being cited to by the tax auditors to support their technical arguments for tax assessment in more recent tax audits. The other related development in this area is the greater level of cooperation and knowledge sharing among countries bilaterally, on a regional basis, and on a global scale. The next bullet should be a no-brainer. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues to disrupt every, everything from stock prices to supermarket shelves, governments around the world have been forced to deliver economic stimulus packages. Many have had to enact multiple stimulus packages that contain measures to subsidize wages, pay for employment benefits, provide tax relief for individuals as well as companies, provide relief to most impacted sectors such as airlines, and fund favorable short-term loans to businesses. These measures have led to many governments currently being in a deficit, and likely with more to be added to the deficit due to additional stimulus measures likely being needed over the years to come. To replenish its coffers, many governments will be looking for sources of additional tax collection in the near future, given the fact that they will not be collecting much tax revenue from locally owned businesses in the years to come, the focus for tax collection will most likely be on large inbound multinational corporations and other foreign investors such as private equity funds and real estate funds. I'm pretty confident that we'll be seeing stepped up tax audits and aggressive tax assessments being made in many countries targeting inbound investors. Lastly, the local tax controversy process. This is a big one and a problematic one at that, since we'll be seeing more and more tax controversy at exit. With aggressive tax audits at exit and larger overall tax assessment amounts at stake, the chances of quickly settling the tax assessment on a reasonable basis will become more difficult. One thing to emphasize up front, and one that rings very true when one is at the tax audit stage, before the case progresses to the administrative or the judicial forums. For a successful tax audit defense, the local practice, norm, and cultural elements are often as important as the well-formulated technical tax arguments. I call this the art half of the art technical ingredient you need in a tax controversy situation. I fondly remember, although this was more than 10 years ago, one of my Western clients having to eat or more accurately, pretending to eat a spicy kimchi soup after a meeting with the tax auditors in Korea. He had flown in from Europe to provide in-person answers related to the tax audit and sharing a meal together, and of course, a meal that the tax auditors wanted to have, was an important part of the overall audit defense. The after story is that he needed a week to recover after that meal. But seriously, assessing in advance the overall tax audit defense strategy will go a long way in increasing your chances of a settlement. However, given that quick settlements at the audit, tax audit stage will become increasingly difficult, investors would be well advised to fully anticipate and engage in the post-tax assessment stages, whether it's an administrative appeals process provided for in the country at issue, 
Tax Matters Dedicated Quasi-Judicial Forum or the regular court and appellate court proceedings. Obviously, the available post-assessment forums will differ country by country, and the chances of getting an unbiased review of your tax case will not be uniform across the board. It is well known that in certain countries, such as India and Brazil, there are many tax cases litigated, and it can, it can take a very long time to get to the final judicial determination. The challenge presented by having to resort to an administrative or judicial tax litigation will be most acute in countries where a fair deliberation on a tax matter brought by a foreign investor is often practically not viable. More on this in part two of the webinar taking place on June 30th. Before I delve into this slide, I just want to note and emphasize that the particular tax issues of focus will be different based on the specific country, let alone the region. For example, as you'll hear later in this webinar, treaty shopping scrutiny is a consistent theme across countries in Asia, due in large part to the fact that treaty-based holding structures have been used extensively to acquire target assets in many Asian countries. But in Brazil and other countries, where it is more prevalent to use an onshore platform, such as asset-backed securitization vehicles or onshore real estate fund structures, rather than a treaty-based structures to acquire a local asset, the particular areas of local country tax scrutiny will be different. For many valid reasons, Cayman Limited Partnerships have been the fund vehicle of choice in many private equity fund structures. Often holding companies are set up under this fund and local country target assets are directly acquired and held by such holding companies. These holding companies are often set up in countries that have favorable tax treaties with the target country. One of the favorable benefits under the treaty would be the capital gains tax exemption at the time of subsequent exit by the fund of the target investment. Because of heightened tax treaty shopping scrutiny globally, some are rethinking this traditional structure and looking at alternatives. One of the alternatives is onshore structure where, for example, the fund vehicle itself, the fund managing activities and possibly holding companies are all centralized in one jurisdiction. We'll be looking at this alternative in more detail in part two of this webinar series. The holding company that is set up to acquire the target asset and the treaty-based capital gains tax exemption claim and exit have come under increasing tax scrutiny by the local tax authorities. The prior days of solely relying on a certificate of residency from the holding company jurisdiction is over. Even those countries that have not been aggressive in typical private equity exit situations are likely going forward to scrutinize treaty claims or capital gains tax exemption by attacking substance, beneficial ownership of holding companies. Physical, operational, and economic substance have been critical factors in, in, in ensuring treaty access but we're also seeing many countries requiring a substantiation of legitimate business purpose for the existence of the holding company in this structure. In many countries, the capital gains tax at exit is collected through a withholding agent mechanism, which often means that the buyer has to account for the tax by withholding the tax amount from the sales consideration paid to the seller and paying it in a timely manner to the local tax authorities. In short, the buyer is on the hook if no tax is paid. Due to the increasing challenges on tax treaty claims that exit by the local tax authorities, a lot of time and effort are often required in negotiations between the two sides regarding the tax and appropriate indemnification provisions. This has resulted in increased usage of mechanisms such as a tax escrow, which basically sets aside the potential tax amount in case the treaty relief is denied for as long as the applicable statute of limitation in the target country. Another interesting dynamic is the task of collecting the treaty-based tax exemption relief forms and adhering to the attendant procedures set by a target country. Because of the need to disclose the identity and the particulars of the ultimate investors to claim underlying treaty benefits, it is becoming a common standard practice of funds investing overseas to request these info upfront from the investors. This can be a cumbersome 
and a time-consuming process for funds as they will need to trace all the way up to the ultimate beneficial owner investors and determine each, each investor's proportionate interest in a target being acquired and sold through the fund. From the investor's perspective, perspective these increasing disclosure requirements that will be provided to the target country authorities often raise various sensitive considerations. With that, let's first go east to the European Union and hear from Benjamin on the current landscape and what's to come in the EU. Benjamin, all yours. Thanks, Andy. Um, as an introduction to this EU discussion, uh, it may be worth noting that the pressure that players on the European private equity market are feeling today has actually started to rise several years ago in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. Indeed, tax evasion has been one of the topics that EU countries have put forward over recent years as the source of many evils that plague European economies, and in particular, budget deficits. This has led the EU to take measures to tackle the tax competition between jurisdictions with, on the one hand, some exciting and challenging projects, such as the ever-delayed creation of a common consolidated corporate tax base across the EU, but also, on the other hand, the tightening of some existing favorable rules. As always, the more punitive aspects of these policies have moved faster than the more progressive projects, and recent years have seen the multiplication of anti-abuse rules issued at the EU level. Now, since these rules have been designed to prevent fraud and tax evasion, many private equity players have assumed that they only apply to fraudsters and have been looking at them as, to put it simply, somebody else's problem, assuming that they would, one way or another, be able to meet the requirements to continue to benefit from exemptions. Well, as is often the case, reality is more complex than that, and the level of proof now required from taxpayers to allow them to avail themselves of some regulations that were hitherto largely taken as granted has shifted the landscape, making cash repatriation quite difficult indeed. As we all know, funds invest in target assets via a sometimes thick layer of intermediary vehicles. The industry has historically been quite successful in minimizing tax leakages in these intermediary entities when repatriating proceeds from the investment and in ensuring that taxation only arose at investors' level. Inside the EU, these minimal tax leakages have been achieved by taking advantage of two sets of tools, EU directives on cross-border dividends and interest, and tax treaties signed between EU countries, which offer either an alternative source of protection in respect of dividends or interest, or more importantly, a protection against taxation of disposal gains. Well, neither of these tools is that easy to use anymore. Focusing on dividends first, Cash repatriation through distributions by the target is not necessarily the most common tool, particularly in leveraged buyout transactions with third-party lenders, but it is still a very relevant item, if only for dividend recap transactions, where a new financing is raised to allow for a cash upstream to the fund. Intra-EU payments of dividends between related parties have been relying heavily on the EU parent subsidiary directive, which provides for a full withholding tax exemption on these flows, provided a couple of simple conditions are met. A typical example would be a distribution by an EU acquisition vehicle to an intermediary holding company located in Luxembourg, held itself directly or through a chain of companies by an investment fund that either is not located in the EU or would not have been entitled to the exception if it had held the acquisition vehicle directly. This includes, for instance, a partnership which is not eligible to the protection given by the directive. The directive included from the start some limitations as to its use, in situations where the recipient of the dividend was held by shareholders outside the EU, but these limitations have been significantly strengthened by the introduction in 2015 of a new anti-abuse rule in the directive. This rule provides that the benefit of the exemption should be denied, denied to arrangements which, having been put into place for the main purpose or one of the main purposes of obtaining a tax advantage that defeats the object or purpose of the directive, are not genuine having regard to all relevant facts and circumstances. In the example I mentioned, the exemption of the distribution by the EU vehicle to its Luxembourg parent holding company was long taken for granted, probably too much actually, as the scope of the anti-abuse rules were, were limited. This is not the case anymore. The tax authorities now can question whether obtaining the exemption was one of the main purposes of the shareholding structure, that is, the use of the intermediary entities in Luxembourg. While an intermediary entity can be set up for a number of non-tax reasons, financing, regulatory, etc., the fact remains that the effect that can be most easily quantified is the tax effect, 
and if the amount of withholding tax saved is significant, it makes it easy for the tax authorities to argue that the value of this advantage exceeds the value difficult to assess of all the other effects. This puts a lot of subjectivity in the question whether a taxpayer can benefit from a withholding tax exemption, very much like the new principal purpose test provisions included in, in, in many tax treaties. I will get back to that in a minute. Taking a look at interest now, the monies invested in the acquisition vehicle will often be a combination of equity and shareholders' loan, the latter allowing for an easier cash repatriation and, incidentally, for a potential tax deduction in the target's jurisdiction. In these structures, the loan ultimately granted to the acquisition SPV often stems from back-to-back -back financing arrangements going up the chain of ownership, potentially all the way to the investment fund. I will not discuss here the tax deduction of the interest in these arrangements, except to say that with the recent introduction of the ATAD a881 and ATA2 directives, this deduction has become a challenge, but I will focus on withholding taxes. Indeed, an important feature of any cash repatriation strategy is that the interest accumulated on the loan should be exempt from withholding tax when paid to the lender up the chain. In this respect, it's interesting to note that the EU directive that provides for withholding tax exemption on interest flows between parent and subsidiary companies does not include an anti-abuse rule like the dividend directive. However, the European Court of Justice recently covered for that missing piece in two steps. First, it established an overarching principle whereby an EU member state has to deny the benefit of a directive if an arrangement constitutes an abuse of rights, and that's irrespective of whether any specific tax avoidance legislation exists in that member state. Second, the ECJ applied this principle in a back-to-back -back loan situation, very typical for a fund investment, and judged that in a situation where the monies upstream are passed on wholly or partially shortly after they are received, this may serve as an indication that the entity is a conduit, and this could be an indicator of abuse. The court also considered the substance of the intermediary vehicles and concluded in the case at hand that the directive's exemption was not available. So both dividends and interest repatriation are now subject to strict anti-abuse analysis, taking into account a the relative weight of the savings generated by the exemption and of the other effects of the structure, and b the nature of the functions exercised by the intermediary company and its role as an actual piece of the economic process rather than a mere interposed entity. I will go faster on this slide, which really only aims at outlining other EU developments that are likely to impact the investment fund industry. The last two ones, that is the exit tax applicable in case of transfer of business and the introduction of strict anti-hybrid rules, are additional anti-abuse regulations that can have impact on the tax shield in various transactions, but they are not directly exit related, insofar as they are not triggered directly by the exit of the deal but exist throughout the life of the structure. The general anti-abuse rule for corporate taxation is of the same nature, but it could become particularly relevant upon disposal in jurisdictions where capital gains from the sale of local shares are subject to corporate, corporate tax. That's, for example, France, Italy, or Spain. Beyond the strictly EU-specific regulations, member states of the European Union have also established a network of tax treaties that are relevant to the treatment of exit flows. These treaties can provide dividend and interest exemptions, with conditions which may, in some instances, be less stringent than those set out in EU directives. But importantly, they can also cover capital gains taxation, which is relevant for jurisdictions such as, as I mentioned, France, Italy or Spain, three jurisdictions in which gains derived by foreign shareholders from the sale of shares in local company are fully taxable. To take the French example, a non-EU private equity fund or an EU fund organized as a partnership, selling a significant shareholding that is above 25% in a French company would generally suffer a 30% taxation on the gain, whereas a treaty-protected Luxembourg parent company selling the same type of stake would not bear this cost. So it is, of course, extremely important to achieve treaty protection to secure a tax-free exit. On that front as well, Things have been growing more and more complicated with increasing attention given by the tax authorities in the member states to the eligibility of the holding company to the benefit of the tax treaty. This debate has long been focused on what is generally referred to as the substance, a topic that most players in the fund industry are familiar with and which is usually well managed. But the OECD's recent works have raised the bar on treaty access with the introduction of the so-called principal purpose test in tax treaties. Many European jurisdictions have chosen to retain this approach over the lighter approach consisting in inserting a limitation of benefits clause in treaties.
According to the principal purpose test, the benefit of the treaty can be denied if, having regard to all relevant facts and circumstances, it is reasonable to conclude that obtaining the treaty benefit was one of the principal purposes of an arrangement or transaction. As can be seen from this definition, the burden of proof is quite low for the tax authorities, since they only have to evidence that it is reasonable to conclude that obtaining treaty benefits was one of the main reasons for an arrangement. If they can achieve that very small step, it will be up to the taxpayer to bring evidence to the contrary, which of course will always be difficult. Indeed, as I mentioned a moment ago, tax benefits have the char characteristic of being reasonably easy to quantify, whereas any other legal, economic, financial or commercial effects are generally more difficult to assess. In a comparison between these effects, it's likely that the one with an actual price tag on it will often be viewed as the more material. What does this mean for, for the investment fund industry? Well, a distinction should probably be made between EU and non-EU funds. And by that, I mean funds for which the vehicle in which the LPs are committed is located inside or outside the EU. So let's take the example of a US partnership investing in EU jurisdictions through a chain of Luxembourg holding companies and the example of a Luxembourg fund investing through the same chain of Luxembourg companies. These funds both invest in jurisdictions that tax capital gain. Say France, I tend to take uh, France as an example a lot because I'm French. Um, because of that, it is important for these funds that the Luxembourg company selling the French shares should be exempt from taxation thanks to the French Luxembourg tax treaty. In this scenario, the US fund will have to provide some rationale for, one, the existence of intermediary holding companies, which could be justified by financing, financing reasons, by the existence of other investors that need to be pooled in a joint vehicle, or any other reason but also some rationale for the location of these intermediary companies in Luxembourg, as opposed to, say, the US or France, which are the two other relevant jurisdictions in this example. If you set up an intermediary holding company, why use a third country when you're investing from the US to France? The EU fund, on the other hand, should have good grounds to justify the location of the holding companies. It is, after all, a Luxembourg fund, so it makes sense for it to use Luxembourg vehicles to carry its investments. But it would still need to provide reasons for the use of this company. Indeed, the French tax authorities in this example could argue that these intermediary entities have only been inserted in the chain of ownership because the Luxembourg fund itself, had it held the French shares directly, would not have been treaty protected. The fund is not a taxable entity and therefore is not a resident for treaty purposes. So investment funds now need to justify not only that the intermediary holding entities that they use do exist and are indeed resident of the jurisdictions in which they are established, that is the substance issue which, substance issue which we have known a long time, they also need to explain the very reason why the intermediary company was created in the first place and, at least for non-EU funds, why they are established in this jurisdiction and not another. It is important to bear in mind that this is a fund structure issue more than a deal issue. In other words, it is difficult to manage this simply on a deal-by-deal -deal basis, but it is more easily handled if the topic is factored in at the time of the fund structuring. As a result of this, we have seen a recent boost of Luxembourg-based fund structures, with private equity players onshoring their funds in order to eliminate at least some of the pressure um, and by strengthening their Luxembourg presence um, when they design their new structure. This slide is a summary of the issues above and briefly outlines the potential challenges that investment fund managers now need to be able to face from a tax perspective. The first one, as mentioned, is the right to benefit from EU directives for dividend and interest, or for tax treaty, for capital gains mainly, but also for dividends and interest, as the case may be. As indicated, the level of response required is probably higher for investment funds that are outside of the EU than for EU funds, and it is even higher for Cayman funds, since the Cayman Islands have recently been put on the EU blacklist. The second potential challenge relates to interest and stems from the beneficial ownership issue. The first possible topic is whether the interest can benefit from directive or treaty rates. The second, particularly for interest that flow up to a Cayman fund, is whether it is tax deductible, as some jurisdictions deny deduction on payments to a blacklist beneficial owner. So it's up to the French, to the local tax authorities, to challenge the intermediary entities look directly up to the Cayman Fund, and they can then not only apply withholding taxes, but actually refuse deduction on the interest. The last one is more incidental, but I thought it was worth mentioning. It relates to the DAC 6 mandatory disclosure rules. Arrangements that include payments to a blacklist jurisdiction are to be reported to the authorities at the time of their implementation, and the left-hand slide 
left-hand side structure raises a possible question in this respect. Um, the right-hand side structure is less of an issue in principle unless the authorities consider that the firm should be looked through to assess who receives the interest payments. To conclude on EU matters, we believe it could be of interest to discuss the real estate investment structure, which is symptomatic of the tightening of regulations over recent years. The diagrams on this slide show typical investment structures in French real estate and the way the evolution of regulations and tax treaties have triggered changes and raised new challenges. The left-hand side diagram shows the very streamlined investment structure that existed until 2006. At that time, due to a mismatch in, in, in treaty interpretation between Luxembourg and France, direct real estate investments in France by a Luxembourg company were fully tax exempt, provided, of course, the Luxembourg company was indeed treaty protected. This loophole was closed in 2006, but indirect investments via a French look-through entity, the SCI in this uh, chart, still allowed Luxembourg investors to exit without any taxation. That is the second diagram. From 2014, France recovered the right to tax gains from indirect sales, and new structure arose using French real estate fund entities, um, that is OPCI, held by a single Luxembourg investor. These tax-exempt entities could sell the French assets or shares in French real estate companies, and distribute the dividend to the Luxembourg parent company with a withholding rate reduced to 5% under the treaty. That dividend was exempted from Luxembourg taxation by the same treaty. So up until that time, uh, it was still possible to structure French real estate investments with a 5% tax leakage. This window closed on, on January 1st, 2020, with distributions from a French OPCI to its 100% Luxembourg parent now being subject to a 30% withholding. On top of this, under the new treaty, comes a Luxembourg communal tax of 6.75%, bringing the effective tax rates to 36.75%. The right-hand diagram, the last one, shows a structure that has gotten some traction over the past few months, which allows for a 15% withholding in France and no Luxembourg taxation. It raises, however, severe anti-abuse concerns. The main one is the justification for the use of two fund entities, that is the French OPCI uh, in the middle and the Luxembourg CIF at, at the top. Um, it is likely that the French tax authorities will question whether one of these two entities, uh, whether it's the French one or Luxembourg one, should be a plain vanilla company instead of a tax-exempt fund. Uh, and then they could challenge the exemption uh, uh, on, the, on the gains. This is probably a development for the next month. This example is a bit French-centric, but it's a good illustration of how EU countries have been closing down on loopholes and investment structures and stepping up their games in, in terms of anti-abuse. There is no doubt that we are only at the beginning of the challenges based on the new regulations and that after the wave of reassessments relating to the deduction of financial charges that we've seen over the past couple of years, EU directives and treaty abuse will be a big part of tax controversy in the EU in coming years and hoping that bleak statement has not depressed our audience too much. And I turn it over to you to talk about Asian aspects. Thank you, Benjamin. Let me first say that Asia is comprised of very diverse group of countries in terms of local laws, cultures, often sensitive history between countries, and certainly when it comes to tax policy drivers and tax regimes. On a more granular level, there is a broad range of sophistication of tax authorities within Asia. Generally speaking, people would point to Australia, Japan, and possibly Korea as having more mature and advanced tax rules. Singapore and Hong Kong have their own unique tax policy drivers that are geared towards being a regional hub for multinational corporations to locate their Asia headquarters or other centralized functions. However, there have been commonalities in approach among Asian countries when it comes to exit-related treaty access claims by foreign investors. Many inbound fund investments into, into Asian jurisdictions have featured the use of so-called treaty-covered holding companies to acquire the local country target shares, a structure that was discussed at the top of the hour. The challenge on such holding companies' ability to access to favorable capital gains tax exemption benefits afforded by the underlying treaty has been prevalent in Asia. In many tax audits involving private equity fund exits, tax authorities have challenged such treaty benefit claims by deeming the holding company to lack the required substance beneficial ownership traits. In actual audit defense assignments throughout Asia, 
work has been centered on substantiating that adequate level of substance exist existed at the holding company level for it to be a beneficial owner of the capital gains income derived at exit. Many countries in Asia have focused greatly on the lack of physical substance, looking at the number of employees at the holding company level and often irrespective of the relative minimal nature of the functions needed at a holding company level to carry out its normal shareholding rights and obligations. Many Asian countries have welcomed the OECD BAPS Action 6 recommendations dealing with curbing treaty abuses and have endorsed the adoption of either or some combination of the Limitation on Benefits Clause, LOB, and the Principal Purpose Test, Anti-Abuse Measures. Benjamin earlier talked about the PPT. An LOB, in contrast, generally consists of a series of objective tests, and these tests determine whether a person is considered to be qualified and therefore eligible for treaty benefits. The LOB is an approach that has long been championed by the U.S. It's reflected by the fact that a substantial majority of existing U.S. treaties contain a standalone LOB article containing the specific LOB test adopted in the Action 6 final report. As tax authorities in Asia challenge a treaty benefits claim by the holding company and adopt a look-through approach, funds, funds and the fund investors are often faced with new issues, such as the investor disclosure requirements for treaty claims. Due to the underlying sensitivities, we're seeing some investors opting out of a possible treaty claim and instead paying the local exit-related tax. We also expect countries in Asia to adopt advanced investor disclosure regimes like the offshore investment vehicle regime in Korea. These procedures would mandatorily require an upfront disclosure of the investors behind the fund as a conditioned precedent for extending respective treaty benefits to each investor under the look-through approach. Another trend in Asia is enactment of domestic tax rules that allow the tax authorities to wield ever-increasing discretion to recharacterize a transaction to reflect the substance and or the intent of the transaction. These would include principles such as substance over form, step transaction doctrine, and general anti-avoidance rule or GAR. Countries like India, China, Korea, Japan, Singapore, Indonesia, and Taiwan have adopted this approach and more countries are likely to follow soon. On this slide 12, I've, I've outlined two other common exit-related tax challenges in Asia. Let me briefly touch on each one of them. One way historically to bypass the target country tax trigger at exit was to adopt a structure which allowed for an indirect sale of the target entity. This can be accomplished, for example, by having two stacked offshore holding companies and having the upper tier holding company sell the shares of the lower tier holding company that directly owns the target shares. Obviously, buyer preferences will need to be considered before adopting this exit option as local buyers may want to acquire the local, local target directly. This mode of exit as a way to not trigger local country capital gains tax has been shut down in various countries throughout Asia. I'm sure you have seen this in India and China. But Indonesia and Vietnam will also treat such indirect share transfer transactions as a direct share sale of the local target shares by effectively denying the informed existence of the lower tier offshore holding company. In Australia and Japan, by contrast, such indirect share transfers will be subject to tax when the underlying local assets are primarily local sited real estate. However, note that other countries in Asia could be adopting the same, so any structuring planning related to an acquisition of a target in, in an Asian country should take this possibility into account. Another common challenge at exit has been based on permanent establishment, or PE grounds. The tax authority's position here is that the fund has a deemed PE to which the capital gains income at exit is attributable. Under this approach, such attributed income would be subject to regular corporate tax liability in the target jurisdiction. In this context, OECD BAPS Action 7 recommendations that significantly lower the threshold for PE creation have been quickly adopted by many Asian countries in their treaties.
From a practical perspective, there are two specific areas that deserve a good level of evaluation. Many private equity funds have Asian regional deal teams situated in Hong Kong or Singapore who regularly spend physical days in target Asian countries and engage in sub substantive activities related to deal sourcing and acquisition or disposition related negotiations. The physical number of days needs to be closely monitored because many Asian country treaties still contain services PE provision and often has a lower cumulative days threshold for a deemed local PE. In addition, the local tax rules will need to be closely monitored as in some countries, the specific local tax rules override the treaty PE article provision on the days threshold. An example of this is Korea, where a provision of similar services continuously over a two-year period can result in a PE. The other issue relates to the onshore material participation in negotiations. Under the new BAPS PE standard, quickly being adopted by many Asian countries, local activity related to deal sourcing and capital raising that falls short of actually executing contracts while physically present in the target country can give rise to a deemed PE. Funds will be well advised to fully assess the role of the deal team members in Asia and possibly adopt procedures to ensure that the PE exposure is properly managed. A couple overriding considerations in assessing whether countries in Asia would adopt the PPT or the US-style LOB as the main treaty shopping weapon of choice in their treaties. First, many Asian countries already have treaties with European countries that contain PPT. For example, UK treaties with Asian countries, almost all of them contain PPT, either as a standalone PPT article that applies for all benefits under the treaty, or as a tag-along provision in the relevant articles, for example, dividends, interests, and royalties articles. The same applies for many Asian country treaties with other European countries. Interestingly, in treaties between Asian countries that contain treaty shopping provisions, PPT is also dominantly featured over the LOB. Second, U.S. does not currently have treaties with Asian jurisdictions such as Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. Even where the U.S. has treaties, for example, with Korea, Indonesia, and the Philippines, these treaties do not contain an LOB article. So Asian countries have not seen LOB and more importantly have minimal experience dealing with the LOB test. With these as a backdrop, let's look at selected individual countries as summarized uh, on this slide. In the case of Australia, there are more PPT containing treaties than ones with LOB, such, such as the treaty with the US. So I would likely say PPT going forward. China is an interesting case. Their recent treaties explicitly have incorporated broad PPT provisions and some of them also explicitly authorize application of their domestic anti-abuse rules to deny treaty benefits. Bucking this trend somewhat has been China's recent treaties with Ecuador and Russia which adopt LOB. A bit surprising given the countries involved there. So based on these recent treaties, likely to be case by case, depending on the treaty partner. Japan's recent treaties and treaty renegotiations have shown a preference for LOB. For example, their treaties with the Netherlands and Switzerland, as well as obviously their treaty with the US. However, Japan has adopted the PPT on a case by case basis. For example, in their recent treaty with Hong Kong. Korea currently does not have any treaties that has LOB, but does have ones with PPT in line with their recent tax audit positions against exits involving private equity funds. PPT is likely to be the preferred route going forward. For both Singapore and Hong Kong, their recent treaties contain PPT, and both governments have either explicitly or, implicit, or implicitly declared their preference for PPT. Lastly, Taiwan's significant number of recent treaties contain PPT. An interesting side note here, for funds building up operational substance in Hong Kong or Singapore, with the possibility of utilizing onshore fund structures in these two jurisdictions to acquire assets in Asia, their tax treaty network with other Asian countries, and in particular 
whether the treaty provides for capital gains tax exemption at exit is an important consideration in the future state fund structures of private equity and other funds. Even before the initi initiation of the BAPS effort, private equity funds and other foreign investors have been facing increasing local target country tax scrutiny on their investment structures. Main reason for this being the nature of the private equity fund investment cycle and often the large capital gains over a relatively short holding period is generated. Some of these well-documented cases have involved local tax authorities, for example, going after the capital gains income of the treaty holding company at exit, involving sale of target company shares by deeming there to be a PE of treaty holding company or Cayman Limited Partnership in the local country and attributing the capital gains income to that deemed PE. Let's go into a bit more detail on the different approaches we have seen taken by countries in denying treaty benefits in particular relating to a typical private equity fund structure. So assume, as depicted on this slide, that a Dutch holding company is selling the shares it owns in country A target and is claiming the source country capital gains tax exemption explicitly contained in the Netherlands country A treaty. Countries that historically had not been aggressive in denying such treaty claim by Holco here are now starting to deny treaty benefits based on lack of substance at the Holco level and based on the argument that it is not the beneficial owner of such income. These so-called stage one countries would, like, would happily then collect the domestic tax rates on such income. We have seen this in countries like China and Indonesia, for example. Stage two, involves local countries allowing look-through to, to determine the beneficial owners of the capital gains income. This often has entailed battles to convince the local tax authorities to look through other intermediary entities above Holco to the ultimate beneficial owners. In many cases, the tracing is applied in a very rigid manner, having to establish each investor's country of residence, and their proportionate interest in the income to be able to access applicable treaty withholding tax rates. We're now seeing incidents of countries that have that had been at stage two taking new steps in challenging treaty access in private equity fund structures. They are po they're positing a new argument that the fund vehicle here, in our example, the Cayman LP, should be treated as a corporation and as the beneficial owner of the capital gains income derived by Holco. There have been court cases in both Japan and Korea where an offshore limited partnership was treated as a corporation subject to tax. In light of this, additional care should be taken in drafting the fund vehicle limited partnership agreements and in reviewing the local laws of the fund's formation. It is of critical importance that all existing and new structures and transactions be reviewed thoroughly. In other words, tested for the desired treaty claims, foolproof for any possible domestic tax law-based challenges. Also, as mentioned at the top of the hour, appeals of local tax assessments in, ad in administrative and judicial courts will increasingly become a requirement as the amount of, of assessment and sophistication of positions for the assessment will increase in the years to come. A quick note on the previous slide, uh, I forgot to mention the, the last bullet on that slide, and it is a reality and something that has to be dealt with, that the policy uh, announced by a specific country in Asia tends to differ quite, uh, quite a lot from the actual practice taking place uh, at, the, at the audit level, so something to be uh, aware of. On this slide uh, and the next slide, we're going to talk about a couple case studies. So this, this case study is a good illustration of how a local tax authority can apply their weapons of choice, here substance over form and general anti avoidance rule, to recharacterize the transaction so that it may be taxed. It also showcases the extent of aggressive technical tax arguments that a foreign fund or investor can be confronted with at exit stage tax audit. What is alarming here is the long-arm approach that can be taken to impose tax on a particular transaction 
that is taking place entirely outside of the country at issue. Let's look at the relevant facts here. We have a seller on the far left of the slide selling the shares of onshore target to a fund. The fund, set, the fund that set up an offshore holding company, which in turn set up onshore holding company, which acquired target. The fund had set up offshore holding company in a favorable treaty jurisdiction, which had a treaty with target country, providing for capital gains tax exemption when offshore holding company had exit sold the shares of target. As part of a, as part of a sales transaction, seller here obtained a special preference share interest in offshore holding company, which gave seller rights to excess return payments if the value of target at subsequent sale by the fund appreciated beyond set thresholds. Let's call this an earn out right for simplicity's sakes. The fund here engaged in debt pushdown facilitated, facilitated through the use of onshore holding company and onshore leverage planning as part of its acquisition financing. After the acquisition, Target borrowed from local banks to fund capital reduction and dividend distributions. Also before the exit sale of Target by the fund, Target was merged with Onshore Holding Company. The tax authority here recharacterized the capital reduction and the dividend distribution transactions between Target and Onshore Holding Company as a transaction between Target and Offshore Holding Company. This was based on the argument that onshore holding companies should be disregarded based on substance over form application and the lack of economic rationale behind the establishment of onshore holding company. This recharacterization resulted in an imposition of dividend withholding tax based on the deemed cross-border dividend payment by, tar by target. There also were issues raised with respect to the applicable dividend withholding tax rate whether the rate under the uh, treaty with offshore holding company jurisdiction applies or should be looked through given the lack of adequate substance at offshore holding company level. Another issue that is often raised in this setting is whether the treaty reduced withholding tax rate even applies if the particular treaty involved explicitly provides that the reduced rate applies to direct versus indirect shareholder in target. So what the dividend article in a relevant tax treaty exactly provides would be important in this context. The other recharacterization put forth by the tax authorities was, was, was with respect to the capital gains distribution on the preference shares owned by seller resulting from the exit sale of target shares. Seller pursuant to the earn out right received this proportionately large distribution resulting from the fund sale of target shares. Although this distribution was pursuant to special preference shares seller possessed in the offshore holding company, the tax authorities recharacterized the earn out right payment as a local source rather than foreign sources as it should be treated in form, other income which was subject to a full domestic withholding tax rate. Once again, I need to emphasize this was a foreign to foreign transaction all taking place offshore. Tax authority of the target country argued the income generated was not capital gains income, but rather other income because capital gains income treatment would have resulted in a tax exemption under the underlying tax treaty. In the second case study, we have an interesting scenario and a refreshing one where we have the taxpayer arguing the application of beneficial ownership and inadequate substance at the holding company level to claim treaty relief on capital gains income derived at exit, kind of taking a page out of the tax authority's playbook. Here, target in country A was acquired by Holco II, a resident of a country that does not have a treaty with country A. Holco II has minimal substance. Now, you may be wondering why this structure was used in the first place, given that the capital gains income from subsequent disposition of target shares now will be subject to full domestic tax liability in country A. Several ways this can happen, including where the taxpayer obtained bad advice from a tax advisor. Let's further assume Holco 1, with a ton of operational substance, is right above Holco 2, and the ultimate investor is right on top of Holco 1. When Holco 2 sells target shares, the tax authorities will be smiling as any capital gains from the sale will not have treaty relief 
and thus be subject to country A tax based on its domestic tax rules. But what if we argue that whole code 2 should be looked through in the same manner and based on the same standards used when it's the tax authorities trying to deny treaty-based benefits? In other words, if whole code 1 in this slide, but assume for this purpose that whole code 1 has minimal substance, had directly held the target shares and sold them at exit, the underlying treaty would provide for capital gains tax exemption and the tax authorities will be challenging the claim of this treaty benefit by pointing to the lack of substance at Holco 1. So in effect here, we're proactively taking the position that a Holco 2 should be looked through due to its lack of substance. And that, we're following this exact same approach taken by the tax authorities. Just as the tax authorities would do, we're self-certifying and can prove, can, can prove beyond reasonable doubt that whole code 2 does not meet the substance requirements under the rules and practice of country A tax authorities. Therefore, therefore whole code 1 should be treated as the beneficial owner of the capital gains income, and such income should not be subject to country A tax under the underlying treaty. And if whole code 1, for whatever reason, does not satisfy the substance standards imposed by country A, then the treaty benefit analysis should be done at the investor's level here. Although this argument would be difficult to make in the U.S., where taxpayers are generally stuck with the form they have chosen, we have, we have seen this argument carry practical weight in several Asian countries on policy grounds. This has been especially true at the administrative appeals level after the tax audit and assessment. This is because an arbitrary application of the look-through approach could result in tax refund claims by funds that were challenged on their treaty-protected holding company structures and had the holding company deny treaty-provided capital gains income tax exemption relief for lack of substance. A very interesting scenario. With that, let's shift gears actually the whole car given the country and look at Brazil. Celso, please take it away. Thank you, Andy. Brazil has 34 double tax treaties in place, think capitalization rules, and social pricing rules. It is playing, it's paying attention to the BATS provision and the recommendations of the OECD and other international agencies on how to develop and modernize its income tax system. But differently from what other presentations today, we will not discuss on next slide LOB provisions or treaty shopping provisions, as well as formulas to, to the substance tests. That does not mean that uh, such provisions are not in force and applicable to, Brazilian, uh, to investments into Brazil, because they are. Nevertheless, they are much more applicable to what we call foreign direct investments of international corporations into their Brazilian subsidiaries. Rather, when we are analyzing alternative arrangements for inbound fund investments, one needs to keep an eye on the tax incentives put in place by Congress and regulatory agencies like the CVM, the Brazilian SEC, to expand the, capital, the Brazilian capital market industries. Therefore, the focus of our presentation today will be zeroing up the withholding taxation on gains and distributions, as well as zeroing up the IOF, a kind of stamp tax, charged on the inflows and outflows of currencies into Brazilian capital markets. It's important, however, to set up a base case scenario where Brazilian businesses in general are taxed at 34% on corporate income and 9.25% on federal VAT, 5% on receipts of services provided and or 18% on sales of merchandises, among, uh, among other minor taxes. That being said, it's relevant that dividend distributions are exempt from withholding taxation to anyone, Brazilian taxpayers and foreign investors. So, as I was saying, Brazilian rule makers set up a number of fund investment vehicles and today we will focus on the, the three most popular ones. First, the private equity investment fund, 
A FIP can invest in shares of public or private held corporations as well as into quotas of a limited liability company. There is no restriction of what those funds invested companies' businesses can be. That law, uh, tax laws applicable to such funds establish that they are exempt for, from corporate income taxation as well as federal, state, and local VATs or sales taxes in Brazil. C. FIPS are not classified as legal entities. Rather, they are considered to be a co-ownership of resources from investors to invest in equity managed by a third-party licensed professional. But the beauty of the FIP lies in two conditions. First, zero IOF taxation on inflows and outflows from FIP for investors. And second, the 15% withholding on redemption of interest or dividends distributions from the FIP as a general rule. As a special rule, however, if foreign investors do not hold more than 40% into FIP interests and are not located in tax haven jurisdictions, then redemption of interests and dividends distributions from the FIP will be exempt from withholding taxation. On page 21 of the slide deck, you will find the Brazilian list of tax haven jurisdictions. Now, great tax litigations have arisen on the last few years related to such FIP structures. First, Brazilian IRS has, have been disputing whatever investments coming from master feeders funds, which may have hundreds of individuals investing on it, can use the FIP withholding exemption if they, are, if they do interpose a three non-blacklisted jurisdictions vehicles before investing into the Brazilian FIP. Delaware LLCs have been used the most for these investment vehicles into the FIP, as they can be used as a, ta a tax transparency entity in the US. Would those Delaware LLC be disregarded to look exclusively to the master fund feeder? Or should the tax authorities disregard the master feed fund structure as well so that the Brazilian IRS can count on all the ultimate beneficial owners of the master funds? Those are some of the questions you should take into consideration when using such Brazilian capital market, market structure. No final answer has been handed yet by the Brazilian Superior Court if the 15% withholding taxation shall apply when dividends are distributed out of Brazil or if the exemption or, of withholding taxation shall apply on this matter. Well, now, there is a special kind of FIP focus on infrastructure businesses in Brazil. They are called FIP IE. All considerations mentioned on the two earlier slides are, are, are applicable to the FIP IE, but there are two new requirements for, the, for this kind of FIP IE so that they can get the same tax benefits of the FIP I have just mentioned. And they are, first, they must have at least five different investors holding less than 40% interest into the FIP IE. And second, they must hold investments into an infrastructure SPV underneath the FIP IE. Important to note that the FIP IE is only being recently used in Brazil after a long term of hibernation because the Brazilian new government have now a big list of public concessions and privatization on its political agenda. Therefore, nowadays, we cannot say of any jurisprudence on tax abuse of such figure. Finally, the real estate investment funds, the so-called FIIs. They can hold the real estate directly or shares or quotas of companies that invest in the real estate market. The important difference here is that the real estate companies are taxed at 34% on their corporate profits, plus 9.25% on federal VAT. And funds, they are exempt of corporate taxation in Brazil.
Therefore, SIIs holding direct real estate assets can be not taxed on the on income and gains derived from the invested real estate. Now, here again, requirements must be met so that investors into an SII are not taxed on redemption of interests and dividends distributions from an SII. First, 95% of profits of an FII must be distributed twice a year. And the accounted method of a cash regime shall be used for that accounting. Second, FII needs to have 50 units holders and publicly distribute its interest under the supervision of the Brazilian SEC and using the B3, the Brazilian Stock Exchange. Third, no unit holder of the key can have more than 10% interest on it. Brazilian tax authorities have been keen on scrutinizing this investment vehicle, especially since they can lead up to a no taxation structure, structure whatsoever. Therefore, substance tests have been discussed to figure the ultimate beneficial owner of the fees units, mainly if they are Brazilian individuals misusing the structure through foreign holding companies. No, now, final answer has not been made yet by the Brazilian Supreme Court regarding the substance tests, neither the Brazilian IRS have provided them. That being said, from the Brazilian part of it, I handed it to you, Andy, again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Celso. This concludes today's webinar. Apologies for the utter failure to squeeze all of this very interesting topics into an hour. We hope the information shared today was useful. Please feel free to reach out to any of today's speakers if you'd like to discuss any of the topics covered today. Lastly, please save the date for part two of this two-part webinar series, which is aptly titled, and it's a mouthful, Navigating the Storm, Initial Structuring, Exit Strategies, and Tax Controversy con Considerations in Asia, the EU, and Brazil on June 30th. Please mark that date. Please note that the venues available in the U.S. for U.S. taxpayers when a foreign tax controversy arises will also be discussed during that part two web webinar. Once again, thank you so much for your participation and have a great day.